Hello, I'm Chief Security Officer Fred Burton, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor, the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. To learn more about Stratfor Worldview, Threat Lens, or Stratfor's custom advisory services, visit us at stratfor.com. Buses, shopping malls, kindergarten. People were killed in dozens every day in the streets of Israel. And the only thing that was able to stop Hamas was the campaign of targeted killing, the most extensive in history of mankind. Welcome to the Stratfor podcast, focused on geopolitics and world affairs from stratfor.com. I'm your host, Ben Sheen. In this episode of the podcast, we discuss what's being described as the first definitive history of the Mossad, Shin Bet, and Israeli Defense Forces targeted killing programs with New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Ronan Bergman. Stratfor Chief Security Officer Fred Burton sits down with Bergman to discuss his latest book, Rise and Kill First, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations. I'm Fred Burton, here today with Dr. Ronan Bergman, the New York Times bestselling author of Rise and Kill First, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations. Ronan, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Hello to your audience. Ronan, I was fascinated by your book. Uh, It clearly... uh, took a long time to put this together. I saw that uh, it actually took seven and a half years, which is uh, a long time in the book business. Uh, Ronan, do you think targeted assassinations work? When you deal with these questions, I think that there are two main issues to examine. One of them is it legally and morally justified. Are targeted killing and assassinations legally and morally justified? And uh, are they effective? And when I say targeted killing and assassination, I, I refer to the same thing. I know that according to American law, the, the way that it's interpreted by American intelligence, it's not the same thing. But in Israel, it does refer to the same thing. I think that everyone can judge on morality. It's, it's, a, it's a very personal perspective. But when you come to effectiveness, after eight years of researching this, I can say think very clearly. Uh, and determine that the answer to that is yes. When targeted killings are part of an overall policy, when they are done systematically, when they are not done in order to satisfy a local audience back home that wants to see that that we are, or the, 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 the country is doing something, and they are not just the fruit of, of, a, of a coincidental chance to kill someone, but as part of a, of, of a systematic and strategic policy, I think that the Israeli experience demonstrates that it, they are effective. And there are a few examples. I can mention one, the uh, jihadist Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in 2001, in, a, in an era in time that was later called the Second Intifada, have launched a horrific campaign of suicide killings, suicide terrorism inside Israel, buses, shopping malls, kindergartens. People were killed in dozens every day in the streets of Israel, which almost brought the country on the verge of bankruptcy. And the only thing that was able to stop Hamas from sending these suicide perpetrators was the campaign of targeted killing, the most extensive in history of mankind that Israel launched in return. Israel did not kill the suicide bombers. Uh, Hamas boasted that they have more volunteers than suicide belts. They killed the upper layers in hierarchy, the bomb makers, the indoctrinators, the recruiters, the regional commanders, the drivers, the political leaders. 
And once these were the targets, and they didn't kill all of them, but they killed enough to paralyze the organization. And in 2004, Hamas, on its knees, begged for a ceasefire with Israel. That was the end of suicide terrorism in Israel. And, and, and it proved that when using precise intelligence and targeting the commanding layer, you can stop even an organization that was seen as, you know, some like a jihadist version of Games of Thrones, that, that, that <laughs> nothing can stop them, that they don't care about nothing. And targeted killing attached a significant price tag to the lives of the commanders. And once they did that, they stopped. It's great to uh, be here with uh, my old friend Ronan Bergman. This is a um, truly remarkable book. Um, it's hefty. It's a very fast read because it's pretty dramatic. Um, targeted killings tend to be. Um, but it also raises all kinds of fascinating moral issues and so forth. And we'll try to get, um, get into those. Um, Israelis like to talk. I've noticed this, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and, um, and I think many of the 1,000 interviewees, which I met for writing Rise and Kill first, uh, they came to a conclusion that this is the unofficial history of Israeli intelligence. It's not authorized, it's not supported by the administration, but yet, after so many years in the dark, in secret, they wanted their part in protecting Israel to be shown. Because, you know, this is a book about clandestine operations, which focuses on many of these pages on targeted killings. Now, in many other countries, that would, be, that would be seen as illegal, or even if country employs these tactics, people will be ashamed or embarrassed to talk about that. In Israel, people are proud that they took these assignments because they are seen by themselves and by at least most of the public as those, as those who were defending the, 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 the peace and the safety and national security of it. And I noticed as I'm reading through it that many of the people who talked to you and talked to you by name were elderly. A number of them have passed away since the time that you uh, interviewed them. Most so of them from natural causes. Well, yes, most of them. Uh, and uh, it's striking to me that they understood when they were talking to you that this was the legacy book yeah. for them. Yeah. They weren't gonna, they weren't going to get another pass at this to tell it their way. And if they were not open enough, then Maybe coincidentally, I could say something about the fact that someone else was taking credit for what something, an operation that they did. Oh, that you usually use, solved that. You use that technique too, huh? <laughs> oh, okay. So, Mayor Dagan, for example. Well, I was about to say, let's start with Mayor Dagan, uh, somebody who both of us uh, knew you better, uh, knew him better than I did. Um, uh, tell everybody who Mayor Dagan was. He just died uh, in 2016. Uh -huh. uh, after, um, but he had only left the Mossad in 2010, if I recall. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so tell us a little bit about Mayor Dagan. What made him such a remarkable person? Where he came from? So Dagan was uh, born to Holocaust survivors, and uh, he was born on a frozen. Uh, floor of a, of a cargo train when his parents were moving back as refugees from Ukraine back to Poland to Lokov in where he was born. When his father came to that place where the ruins of that city, he found someone who actually took photographs of the last scenes, the last minutes of the Jews. And when he developed that film, he found the actual pics of his father, meaning Mayer's grandfather. grandfather. On Mayer his, used to keep this on his desk, yeah. as I recall. And Mayer had this, these photographs. There are two images of that ultra-religious guy on his knees with his hands in the air. And these Gestapo uh, and, and, military and, and German military uh, soldiers pointing a gun at him, smiling, just, just minutes before he was executed. And he used that image. He pointed out that image to everyone coming to his office, subordinates as uh, like colleagues from other intelligence agencies, and said, "You look at this picture. This is my grandfather. And we are here 
and the Mossad is here, and I am here, Dagan, to make sure that this will never happen again. No more, no second Holocaust. And, the, and, and, he, and he took this very seriously. Something about his, his young, oh, being a young officer in the, in the IDF, uh, he, he met Errol Sharon when Sharon was a general, the, the, the top military commander at, at the South. And there, was a, there, was, there were Katyusha missiles with fuses, timer, in, inside the minefield. And nobody dared to get close to them. Only Dagan, that was later described by one of his followers, said the organ of fear was disconnected from the rest of his body. So he was just walking through the mines and de defused the, the, the Katyusha rockets. And Sharon was very impressed. And then he put him in charge of a small unit of counterterrorism and targeted killing inside Gaza Strip. And back in the 70s, the Gaza Strip was controlled by the, the PLO. Allegedly, the IDF controlled it, but the PLO was, in, in, in fact, in control. And Dagan developed a new doctrine, a new fighting technique, how to be dressed as an Arab, get very close to the most wanted terrorist, and before they know it, draw the pistol or the rifle and, and kill them. Um, this is where also the, Sharon came up with the famous phrase. Uh, when Sharon appointed Mayor Dagan to be the chief of the Mossad, he admired Dagan. And in 2002, Sharon was fed up with the more, I would say, diplomatic approach that the Mossad took. And he appointed Dagan. And in the uh, inauguration ceremony, he said, Mayor, I wanted you to do to the Mossad what you did back, time, back in time in Gaza. I want a Mossad with a dagger between the teeth. And I met with Sharon at that time. And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, do you really think that Mayor Dagan, you know, have this prestige of a rogue officer, trigger happy, would install back Mossad to its, uh, pre uh, its famous days of glory. It's one thing to run an assassin unit in Gaza of a few hundred people or a few dozen people, and it's, it's a different to run an organization with practically thousands of employees. And Sharon replied, he said, Ronan, I'm sure mayor will bring back the glorious times of Mossad. And you know why? And I asked, I asked why, but I knew that some black humor is coming. Right. It says, do you know what mayor's main expertise is? He said, what is that? He said, his mayor, Dagan, best expertise is the separation of terrorists from his head. <laughs> there was a, th this was the politically correct version of that joke. Yes, he, had, yes. he had even a, a, a yeah. worse version. So that made Dagan sound pretty brutish, and it's a pretty famous quote about him. Uh, my experience with him, which came more at the end of his life and after he had been out of the Mossad and as I was getting ready to write about a cyber operation in which he was deeply involved, the Olympic Games, the operation against, uh, against uh, Iran, I found him to be an incredibly subtle geopolitical thinker. And I think one of the wonders of your book is that comes through, particularly at the end where he and Netanyahu separate ways on the question of whether it's wise to go bomb Iran. And um, so take us a little bit through how somebody who gets his start separating terrorists from their heads ends up basically saying the greater security of the state of Israel is not to go bomb Iran's nuclear facilities. If Mayer was sitting here, he would say that he didn't change, that Netanyahu changed, that, that, that his perception was the same one throughout time. But he did, and I'd say a word in a minute about that. Dagan believed that Israel should not go to an all-out war. He believed that the Six-Day War triumphant victory was a one-time. It, it will never repeat itself. That Israel should go to an all-out war, quoting him, only if the sword is on our neck. And all the rest should be handled efficiently with pinpoint focused operation way beyond enemy lines, sabotage, installment of viruses, computer viruses, as you said, targeted killings. He said, we have to have an overall policy when it came to Iran. He said, you know, a car has something, it's a regular car, has something like 25,000 different parts. If you make sure that the, the manufacturer of that car doesn't have 100 parts, it just, it, it wouldn't move. Meaning we have to block the export of dual use equipment to Iran. But then he said, he smiled, well, sometimes it's just more efficient to kill the driver. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And Dagan thought that he would be able to stop or at least significantly delay the Iranian nuclear project by secret means. Political pressure, uh, prevention of export of dual use equipment, encouragement of opposition groups, and special operations. Economic, any, any economic boycott and economic steps. He established a special unit called uh, a Sphere to cripple the Iranian economy. And he started and he launched a huge campaign of assassinations and uh, sabotage through the Iranian nuclear project. And that worked. But for some reason, both Minister of Defense Ehud Barak and Prime Minister Netanyahu thought it's not enough. They thought that Israel should go for an all-out strike, aerial strike, combined with ground forces on the Iranian nuclear sites. And in that point, Dagan almost, I would say, prefer, performed a mutiny against them. He, what he did was to do everything in his power, and he was extremely powerful and extremely courageous and, and, and influential to stop that, to the extent that in his last day in duty, he invited myself and some other journalists secretly to the Mossad headquarters. Now, I was surprised to receive the invitation because for years I've been levering some harsh criticism on the organization, but you know, the chief of the Mossad invites you to come in. You wouldn't say no. He steps in. So we came before. Uh, the Mossad did whatever they could to give the uh, atmosphere of clock and dagger. They put us in a a special bus with black uh, uh, windows, and uh, they uh, made sure that we're not carrying any uh, devices to record, to, to record the conversation. Anyway, he, he steps in, he shakes everybody's hand, he comes to me, he says, well, you are some kind of a bandit. And then he starts bashing the prime minister and says, the fact that someone was elected doesn't mean that he's smart. He was using a cane because he was injured in, from a mind by the terrorist he was hunted in 1969. He said, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an advantage to be hit by a, by a mine in your spine. You get a certificate from a physician that you have a spine. <laughs> and then, and we understood, it just, it's not just, uh, just a joke. But, but practically, what he did was to delay, to further delay and delay the strike because he thought that the sword is not on our neck, that we will be able, that Israel will be able to hold the Iranian nuclear project, and we will be able, Israel will be able to get the Iranian economy so crippled that either they would agree to a compromise to disassemble their project, or it would lead to a, to a regime change. Well, we'll come back to him at the end, but one of the remarkable things about the book is you go pr pretty far back in history. Um, so let's go back a little bit to some of the, the bigger moments. So first of all, it wasn't until I read this book that I knew that the Mossad actually recruited in the mid-60s Hitler's chief of special operations. Not somebody you would think the Israelis would be eager to employ. Tell us about that. I think this is one, one of the most remarkable moments in the history of Israeli intelligence, and th there were remarkable moments there. Um, very briefly, Nasser of Egypt recruited scientists and engineers who used to work in Pinamunda. That's the base in the, the secret Gestapo SS-run base in the Baltic Sea during the Second World War where the Wehrmacht developed the V1 and V2, the mother and father of the Scud missiles that later hit um, Antwerpen and London. After the war, these scientists had nothing to do in Germany. Nobody wanted to employ someone who worked for the Gestapo. And so they went to work for Nasser. The Mossad was hunting Nazis because some people in the Mossad thought that there might be some Nazis trying to rebuild the Reich. There weren't any. And the fact was that the only Nazis or the only people who worked for the Reich who actually posed national security to Israel were not identified. And it was not until Nasser parade the missiles in July 1962 that Israel discovered what is happening and was in shock. Just imagine the picture. Israel in 1962, shortly after the Second World War, young, fresh, flood with Holocaust survivors, hear that Nasser, who and is compared no, to Hitler... No nuclear weapon yet. No nuclear weapon. Before the Six-Day War, and the, you know, some confident that that brought, they hear that people who used to work for the original Hitler in Pinamunda are now developing weapons of mass destruction for the new Hitler, Nasser. 
And Nasser is boasting that with these missiles, he's going to hit any target south of Beirut. And the voice of thunder from Cairo, the Egyptian radio, says, this is the weapon with which we are going to destroy Al-Hay'a Asayuniya, which means the Zionist entity. They didn't say Israel. Imagine the hysteria. And Mossad was trying to kill the scientist, and it failed at that time. And it, didn't bring, it did not bring uh, enough fear among the, 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 the other ones because NASA was paying them a lot of money. And the Mossad needed someone inside the project. And a German-born Mossad case officer who lost all of his family in the Holocaust said, I think we should go and recruit Otto Skorzeny, who was close to them. He was the chief of special operations for Hitler. He was running the SS battalion in Kristallnacht in Vienna, an avid Nazi. He was wanted for the Nuremberg trial and fled in the, right, the last moment to Spain. And that guy from Israeli intelligence says, let's recruit him. He will bring us the intelligence that we need. The chief of the Mossad says, you are going to recruit him when I'll grow hair in the palm of my hand. And they approached him through his wife, and they offered him something that no one else could. Life without fear. It was two years after Ahmed was, was trialed and executed. And they approached him as Mossad, meaning they didn't claim to be someone else, not false flag. And he agreed. He had four conditions. To have a new passport, money, a letter of immunity from Prime Minister Eshkol, and to be taken off the Simon Wiesenthal's one, most wanted list. But now imagine the, 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 the gravity. I can see the, how they get the three. I'm not sure how you get yeah, the, the fourth. fourth so the, the three could, could be given by Israel. Right. But the fourth, they sent someone to Simon Wiesenthal, someone from the Mossad. And he said, listen, Mr. Wiesenthal, we cannot tell you why, but please take Otto Skorzeny off your list. And that guy said, um, I have a great respect to the Mossad and to Israel, but there's no way I will get Otto Skorzeny. He's a war criminal. We will not get him off the list. Now, Skorzeny was disappointed, but yet he cooperated and he became the most important Mossad asset in the first, first part of the 60s. And he solved the problem of the, the German scientists working in, in Egypt. This is the most remarkable moment. A German-born Mossad operative. And where was he living? living? He was living in Spain. Living in Spain. During and he, he died in 1976. And um, we have some pictures from the, his funeral where everybody salute in the Nazi, uh, the Nazi way. Meaning he, he did not desert the way, but, but Mossad, there was, a, there was a discussion. There was a debate whether to recruit him or not. And at the end, pragmatism prevailed. The that Prime Minister said we should recruit him because he helped us to solve current problems rather than to chase ghosts of the, of the past. It's really a remarkable story because you could have imagined it going the other way more easily. Um, there was an excerpt in the Times Magazine uh, over the weekend of another remarkable story you tell in here about um, the moments, several of them, when they tried to kill Yasser Arafat. One moment when they were absolutely certain he was on a commercial airliner and uh, the orders were to go take that airliner down even though they would kill many civilians and somebody stepped in the way of that order. Other moments when he was within uh, the sights of a sniper. So, first of all, in the Mossad strategic calculation, or the strategic calculation of those who were um, commanding the Mossad and the prime ministers at the time, what was the advantage of killing Yasser Arafat? Wouldn't the blowback have been greater than the gain? Um, the book is not just about the Mossad, it's about the whole of the Israeli intelligence community and decision-making process. And killing Arafat, who was called the head of the fish, that was the code name, um, may, became a personal issue for Ariel Sharon. This was not a Mossad thing. On the contrary, Mossad recommended since 1974, you'll probably recall his famous speech at the UN with the gun, where he tried to portray himself as a politician. From that point, Mossad recommended to take him off the list. But when Ariel Sharon, Sharon was appointed Minister of Defense by Menachem Begin in 1981, he immediately put Arafat back. 
In fact, he, he asked the chief of staff, why haven't you killed him already? Like, how come he's still alive? How come Mossad doesn't have a journalist among the flock of journalists escorting him with a, a camera that has a, a gun disguised in it? Um, and Sharon ordered him to be killed. Now, there were numerous attempts just before the invasion to Lebanon in 1982, during that and immediately after. And they were all either failed because Arafat was careful enough or foiled and disrupted and stopped by courageous officers who said, we are not going to perform. With all due respect to that obsession of Minister of Defense Sharon, we are not going, the, the fact that he, w he was a legitimate target was not dis disputed. He was the number one enemy of Israel. And there was no one who said, the, the, he's not, he's not legit, it's not leg legitimate to, to kill him. But yet, there were people around him. And these courageous officers, from ground troops to the, uh, to the commander of the Air Force, said, we are not sure that he's duly identified in that airplane or the other. And second, we are not going to kill civilians. And so they did everything they could. They jammed the communication. They stopped. They stole time. In one of the operations, uh, the chief of the Air Force, David Ivry, was commanding the war room, the subterranean war room of the Air Force in Tel Aviv. And he was ordered to take out an airplane, a cargo airplane, going from Athens to Cairo with Arafat on board. Mossad identified Arafat on the ground, just aboarding the airplane. They said the target, the head of the fish, has grown beard to conceal himself. But yet, we are sure it's Arafat. Something doesn't, didn't sound right to Ivry. So he stole time. The F-16 also already intercepted the, the, that cargo plane. But he said, I want more corroboration. I want more information. And the Minister of Defense and the Chief of Staff are pressuring him, give the order to engage, take down this airplane. And he stole more and more time until the very last minute it was finally known that it was Arafat on board, but not Yasser, his brother, Fatri, the head of the Palestinian Red Crescent, with 30 wounded children from the massacre in Sabra and Shatila. He took them for medical treatment in Cairo. And only thanks to the firmness and opinionated stand of General Ivry, uh, this, these children were saved, and Israel was not stained with this horrific uh, uh, incident. You imagine, particularly after Shabbos, what that would have been like. And Ivry is now the head of Boeing Israel. Yep. Yeah, Ivry is the head of Boeing Israel. This, this story I, I heard first in 2011. And the one who told me that said, the only way I can, you can quote me on that is that if you go to another source, another person, and if he tells you that story, that Ariel Sharon ordered to take out airlines, air, commercial airlines with Yasser Arafat, <coughs> and the Air Force stopped him, only if he give that to your own <coughs> record, Will I be able to, I will give you the, the, the full story. So I went to that other person and I thought, how can I get him to speak? I know he's like a tough general. And I went from that point to the other, from that angle to the other, and then I asked him the question. His look changed and he says, you know, for 30 years I have been waiting for someone to come and ask me about that. <laughs> he stood up, this was a huge of office overlooking Tel Aviv. He went to the other side of that room he opened the safe, and he pulled out the file of documents from that, the, the flying log from that operation. He was keeping that, waiting for someone to ask him. How could reporters just, operate? Yeah. yeah. And just, just this morning, uh, General Levy called me and said, you know, I just found a note, a handwritten note from the chief of staff. Do you want it? And he emailed that to me. There's a note from chief of staff uh, Eitan saying, David, Arafat is going to fly from Jordan to Tunisia in that airplane. If he's identified, take it out. So it's a handwritten, it's a historical document. Very dramatic. It is pretty dramatic. Um, there were other opportunities, including a moment where Arafat was sitting in a sniper's crosshairs. Why didn't they fire? Arafat decided uh, to accept American mediation and evacuate Beirut to prevent... Um, violence. And what year was this? This was August 31st, 1982, after the bombardment of Beirut and the siege. And 
he just made one condition. He just he said, I want the US president to guarantee my safety. And the US President Ronald Reagan phoned Menachem Begin and said, Listen, I want to have your word that you will not take this opportunity and kill Arafat. And Arafat was on the hindsight of seven different Israeli snipers. One of them, Moshe Yaelon, later to be Israeli defense minister. And he recalled that moment. He said, here, on the tip of my finger on the trigger, I have the, the head of the fish. And I ask for permission to, in, to, to open fire. But the chief of staff says, no permission. Prime Minister says he gave his word. And the photograph that was taken by the sniper, one of them we used in that uh, okay. recent New York Times story, was given to Philip Habib, the American mediator, that evening to show that Israel could take Arafat out and didn't because of that promise to President Reagan. Wow. Just imagine the frustration from the point of view of the, of the, of the snipers. And Yalon, as you and I know, is not the world's most patient human being. No, not very much. And did he talk about this later on? Yeah, well, you know, Yelon is one of the examples of a unique Israeli phenomenon. These operations, targeted killing, assassinations, sabotage, are done in very small groups, of course. It's, it's extremely secret. And they are being authorized in Israel only by one person, the Prime Minister. There is no way to go with an operation of that kind without the direct involvement of the Prime Minister. So the procedure is that the chief of an organization, the Mossad, for example, goes to the prime minister, usually to his private house or the, the, the home in Balfour Street in Jerusalem, and bring the people from the operation with him to, to convince him. Just imagine, you have the boss, but you also have very young people, most of them under the age of 30, some of them under the age of 25, going to the prime minister to convince him to issue a death verdict to, against someone to convince him that that someone posing a reliable and, 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 and vivid threat to national security, and this is why he, was, he needs to be killed. Now in Israel, only in Israel, through time, through history, some of the people, the young people, in time, cross that room and become the Prime Minister or the Ministry of Defense. Ehud Barak, Benjamin Netanyahu, Moshe Yaelon, they were all part of these young people who came to convince Prime Minister and then became the Prime Minister. And you come to think, you come to ask yourself, so what exactly does it change their mindset to have being engaged in these operations, not in, you know, not in thinking, not in knowing, but actually be there with the sniper rifle pointing at the head of the, of the fish. And then becoming a minister of defense or prime minister that need to have other means like statesmanship, like diplomacy, like negotiation. Does it change their mindset? So, Ron, this gets to one of the great moral issues that runs through the book. There are not many Western democracies that have a tradition of targeted assassination. You could argue that the United States has done that with its drone program. We don't call it targeted assassination because we do it from... 15 to 30,000 feet. Well, you, you call it targeted killing because of legal reasons. That's right. Because it's forbidden to assassinate someone, but it's legal but to target and kill someone. That's right. Um, you'd be a fine American lawyer. Um, uh, you do see a lot of authoritarian states do this, states that Israel would not want to emulate. What makes this acceptable? in a modern-day Israeli society, even one that remembers the grandfather who's pictured on the desk the way Mayor Dagan kept his grandfather's picture? We are still a society that sees itself in a state of war. The new Israelis, like Dagan, who came from Europe and established the state of Israel, its intelligence services and armed forces, I think they drew three main lessons from the Holocaust. The first is that there will always be a Goy, a Gentile, who is after us to perform a second annihilation. The second lesson is that the, the other Goyim, the other Gentiles, are going to stand aside and do nothing to help, if not help the first Goy. And the third lesson is that we need to have 
a safe haven. We need to have a homeland and protect that in all costs. Now, when your prime nemesis every decade calls for your destruction, and you have that in the back of your mind, President Nasser, um, um, Saddam Hussein who threatened to, to, the, to burn half of Israel, Yasser Arafat that wrote the Palestinian Covenant in which there is no place for Jews in Palestine, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and all the rest. When that's your prime nemesis, and you fear for a second Holocaust, you will save no means, and you will do whatever you can with little attribution to international law, if at all, to protect yourself. Is that going to be acceptable 20 years from now? If Israel continues to fight the same kind of wars and perceive itself as fighting for existence, I think so. I think, and, 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 to, and look, just 20 years ago, this was by far less acceptable since Israel started to use these uh, um, tactics openly after the uh, eruption of the Second Intifada and against suicide bombing, and especially after the United States started to kill people um, after September 11. This has become, I would say, part of modern warfare, and even accepted by international law that you can kill a terrorist even if he's not during an operation, and even, even if he's alone at bed at night. This is a very fine and very important distinction and a change in, of international war law. If in all times, traditional law, you can only kill a, ter uh, a soldier when he's fighting, but he, when he goes home, he's not a, a legitimate target. A terrorist can be killed wherever he is. And this is accepted nowadays even by Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. So... There are moments where this has gone wrong or Israel has been caught. And one of those moments was the beginning of the end of Maradagan's remarkable career. It was in Dubai. Yep. Tell us the story. Mossad was rebuilt by Dagan, as Sharon wanted him. Mossad with a dagger between the teeth and a series of successes. You know, they have been able to penetrate and sabotage the Iranian nuclear project. They, were, they disrupted the line of communication and supply of arms, sophisticated equipment from Syria and Iran to jihadist movement in the Middle East. They assassinated people. They, they were, the gun created a viable, secret, unbelievable, profound, intimate cooperation with Arab intelligence services. You know, the gun understood that on one hand, these countries, they are against Israel in the, in the open sphere, the open diplomatic sphere. They condemn us in the United Nations. They said nothing would happen until the Palestinian problem is solved, etc., etc. But on, on, the, on the face of it, we share the same interests. They fear, they, they hate uh, the regime of... They hate the regime of Assad in Damascus. They loathe Hamas, and they fear most, even more than Israel, that Iran will get a nuclear bomb. So the guns started to fly secretly in private airplanes from one cap Arab capital to another and offer them cooperation. And much of the, without getting into the details, I'll not spoil the book, uh, of course, but they, he, much of the successes that were attributed to Mossad were, were thanked to the cooperation with Arab countries against their brothers. And then Dubai came. Dubai was a result of hybris. The gun sent 27 operatives to Dubai to kill a Hamas, Hamas uh, operative. Kind of a mid-level Hamas operative. A mid-level Hamas operative. He, that, that was, it, he, it didn't worth the risk, even if they performed wonderful. By the way, he was killed twice. Mahmoud al-Mabhuch was, was killed twice. The first time was in September of 2009. They poisoned his drink, but apparently poison is not an exact science. He got ill. He flew back to Damascus. He hospitalized himself in a military hospital in Damascus. They diagnosed him with, uh, as having mono, and he recovered. <laughs> he didn't even know that he was so close, close to die. Now, imagine the extent of frustration in Mossad doing all this huge effort, and that guy only got mono. <laughs> so next time, they made sure that they see him die. And the, the last thing he saw was Mossad operative looking at him, making sure that he's closing his eyes forever. Then they stripped him, they put him in a pajama, they put him in a room, they left, they thought it's just going to be a great success. They didn't think 
that the, Mossad, that the Dubai police would understand this is a murder. And that shortly afterwards, they, collect, they would identify the operatives and would collect the CCTV camera videos from all over the, the city. And soon, the whole world would be watching them. You saw them come in in their tennis clothes and... The yeah, and you know, some of them looked, uh, in, in retrospect, it looked by far less uh, James Bond stuff and more Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> they, some of them were cl quite clumsy, not so in shape. There were people in Israel who thought, well, this is comforting. We can also be Mossad operatives. <laughs> not all of them highly fashioned. Um, in Israel, by the way, it's just a small country, so in Israel... Everyone looked at the mugshots that were published by the, the, the Dubai police and, and searched for a cousin or someone. And they, they all, it's so, such a small country. We all found someone that we know. Um, so but this, this, this caused an enormous damage to Mossad. Israel was again caught using false, forged passport of countries that it promised not to use. And the, my, m many operational units got shut down because of what happened there. And this was at, toward the end of Dagan's time. Yeah. Dagan later complained to me that I didn't give enough credit to Israel for uh, Olympic Stuxnet. Games Olympic and Stuxnet. Games, yeah. And I kept thinking that Stuxnet became his way of trying to make up for the mistakes of Dubai. Am I right? I think that Stuxnet started before that, but he wanted to to show that success, to demonstrate that success as an answer to all those people who said that he failed in the last part of his, of his duty. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the reason, by the way, when you go to tactics, the reason why Dubai failed was because of the documentation. It's very hard nowadays to be a covert operation agent. Um, Rafi Eitan, long-time Mossad operative who captured Eichmann, he said, you know, in old times, it was so easy to forge passports. Sometimes we forge passports of countries that do not exist. <laughs> in nowadays, having such a deployment of means against terrorists, biometric, everything online, you know, um, a, a reliable passport, it's very, very Being hard. Being a spy is harder work. It's, it's much, much harder work. And they were called, the, the, the operatives in Dubai were called because they were using the same documentation every time they followed Mahmoud al mabkhur to Dubai, and the only thing that the commander of the Dubai police had to do was to pull out the list of people who came each time before and immediately after the guy to Dubai and just match, match the, the names. And after, shortly afterwards, he had all the names of the people. And published them. And published them. And said, Mayor Dagan, if you are a man, come forward and, and, and surrender yourself to, to custody. He didn't do it. Uh, well, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to go to a few questions that we got from the audience. And here's one that I only get three times a week. <laughs> um, do you think that your work may be undermining the security of Israel? Is that a concern of yours? I'm sure you've never been asked this question. No, not, yeah. not in the last four hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I think that my work is helping the security of Israel. I think that being a democracy is by far our number one um, pillar of security. And that helps everything. And I think Mayor Dagan, at the end of his time, fought for democracy and fought Benjamin Netanyahu very hard to preserve democracy. Um, I am an Israeli citizen. I think I'm very loyal to Israel and Israel's security. And um, I think that what I'm doing, what we are doing, is to, put, to, to make ourselves look at the mirror, look at history to understand how profound was the impact of Israeli intelligence, not just on themselves and not on tactical issues, but on the history of the state, and bring that truth to light and have these people tell their stories. You know, you, you just mentioned that some of the interviewees have already passed away. You know, the testimonies that they gave me are the only ones that exist outside the vaults and safes of the Mossad. Sometimes the only one exists. If it was not us to collect them, their testimonies about events that are like, like at the center of Israeli history were just going away. And I don't think, I, I, you know, I, I get these complaints, of course, all the time. Sure. I don't think that, that, uh, that it, it has. I, I think if, if it does, it forces Israeli intelligence to be more subordinate to some sort of outside 
um, supervision. The country, the country institution do not supervise the intelligence services. And in that case, the, the press, journalists, historians have a, a holy doubt, a holy, holy depth and holy um, duty to do that th themselves. But I remind people all the time, you know, the difference between the United States and its Western democracy friends is we have a First Amendment and they do not. Mm -hmm. And you still have military censors who are out there. You published this book today. Yes. In the United States. Is it being published in Israel simultaneously? No, just because I didn't have the time to retranslate to, to Hebrew. Uh -huh. We finished the first manuscript back in 2014, and we have been updating and editing the English version. So it departs from the Hebrew original. Now I have to translate it back. back. So it's going to appear in Hebrew in a month or two. But you will expect no difficulty distributing it, particularly once it's already been published in the United States. Yeah. Um, of course, there will be voices in Israel who will say that some of these stories should not be published. Already, there are people, you know, there's a, there's a paper in Israel called Israel Today, Israel Ayom, owned by an American by the name of Sheldon Edelson. I don't know if you heard about him. And this is distributed for free. This is why Tom Kaplan, when he said, that Yediot Achonot is the most read, paid paper. He smiled because he referred to Israel Leon, which is free. Now, they said they've already published an op-ed saying, why did Ronald Bergman publish the story in the New York Times? This should not have been told. A and story about Yasser Arafat, yeah. who's been dead for some time. Yes. Yeah. Um, very good, short question. What's the real story with the acquisition of the submarines? Wow. <laughs> short story. So, so short question. I can speak about this for two weeks. I, I'll say this very briefly. It's not in the book. The Israel has, has um, bought nine submarines from Germany. These submarines are, are termed as the, the insurance policy of Israel. They carry nuclear weapon and have the ability to launch a second strike on Israeli adversaries in case of that Israeli air for airfield and missile sites are destroyed during a war. Um, they are bought with huge uh, subsidy, subsidiary from Germany. Germany government, German government is paying for much of that. And there are strong suspicions, more than that, that there's corruption, that, that the German dockyard uh, Thyssen Group has paid Corrupt, uh, it's paid bribery to officials in Israel to have a bigger and more expensive deals. There are allegations against the Prime Minister and people around him that they were part of that, but there are still, there's still a very strong and extensive police inquiry, um, and it will take time until they publish their, um, uh, their findings. What are the lessons learned from Israel and Iran's nuclear program uh, and what do they tell us about Trump and North Korea? Israel was killing an Iranian scientist. And that led to few outcomes. One of them was that instilled fear among the, the rest of the, the scientists. And they started to quit their job. Uh, Mayor Dagan called that white defection, meaning they didn't leave to another country. They just said, I had enough. My friend there was killed. The other one lost a leg. I don't want any of that. I'm going back to, to teaching in uh, Tehran University. And the Iranians were also giving so much time into trying to prevent the next assassination and fearing from Mossad spies in, inside the system. So they devoted so much effort into rescreening everybody, prevent, trying to uh, find the, the viruses, that they themselves delayed the project in two years without the Mossad even doing anything. And at the same time, economic sanctions worked, and it crippled Iranian economy significantly. But then, Errol, sorry, uh, uh, Prime Minister um, uh, Netanyahu and Defense Minister Ehud Barak started to threaten that they are going to strike. You know, in, in early January 2012, I published a cover story with the New York Times Magazine where I had Ehud Barak saying, we are going to strike Iran. That put the American administration, the Obama administration, in a situation when they thought Iran is going, Israel is going to strike. There's going to be a war. And they 
instead, Netanyahu hoped that the Americans would strike instead of Israel, but it led to the the, uh, the, the opposite. Barack Obama. Yeah, yeah the, it led to the opposite outcome. Instead of striking, President Obama started a secret negotiation with Iran without notifying Israel. In late 2012, when the Mossad was just about to kill another scientist, a young intelligence officer came to Tamir Pardo, then the chief of the Mossad, who is, I understand, coming for the Day of Independence to give a, a speech here at the Y, um, and said to him, we, we just learned that the Americans are negotiating behind our back in Muscat, in Amman, with the Iranians. And I think that the Mossad should not continue to have aggressive actions in Iran when our allies are negotiating with them. And Pardo went to the Prime Minister, Netanyahu, and said, listen, we should stop. We should hold off to the aggressive actions. And Netanyahu agreed. And what happened was that because Netanyahu intimidated the Americans to the extent that he is going to strike Iran, the negotiations started too early. If it would start too late, two years later, the Iranians would be in much better, m much worse in shape, much more crippled. Because it started too early, it led the Iranians to have a much better deal. So in that sense, you can say that Netanyahu is complaining about a deal that his actions actually led to be created. So somebody here has written um, the future of cyber weapons and how they will change traditional tactics and strategy. Not much of that in Rise and, uh, and Kill First, but a movement toward that in the rest of Israeli intelligence? Yeah, cyber occupies Israeli intelligence very much. They even created a special realm. It's called Yugint. Uh, we speak about human, human intelligence. Mm -hmm. We speak about SIGINT, signal intelligence. Mm -hmm. And now we speak about Yugint, human intelligence for, SIGINT, for signal intelligence. Mm -hmm. So you have a human asset, and it helps you plant the virus that would enable you to have a cyber penetration to the target. Which is a lot of how Olympic Games was done. Which is a lot of how Olympic Games w was, was done. And this is, this is taking a main, main part in Israeli intelligence um, today. And, you know, much of the training that used to be and much of the target uh, and much of the intelligence collection can be done with, you know, Google Maps today and much is diverted to that issue of how you penetrate the main data, data banks of your, of your opponent. Also, how do you have enough malware that in real time, in war, you can cripple his, his economy and you can cripple his, his, his main... Uh, and not only enterprise. enough, but have it in the right place, which is the hard part. Yeah. yeah. But also, uh, I can tell you that the Russians are deploying everywhere. Israel has found... We, we've noticed that here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Israel has found uh, Russian imprints inside the Israeli SCADA systems. It's not clear to Israelis why they have them, but the Russians are everywhere and they're doing huge effort to be prepared for something, for someday, for something to happen. Well, tell them they're not alone in that one. Um, given the advancements to the Israeli military and economy, do you still think Israel faces a 60s-like existential threat? Or is that narrative and that fear outdated? I think that's a superb we, question. Yeah, I think that we do not have any existential threat from the outside. I think Israel is enjoying the best time of security since its establishment. I think Israel, uh, just imagine what happened 20 years ago. The joint forces of Iraq and Syria together had 54 divisions of tanks. The nightmare scenario from the Israelis was that these divisions would just start rolling towards Israel. Now both of these forces do not exist anymore. There is no force in the Middle East that could match or to, could threaten, could scratch the IDF. Um, the Israeli intelligence is by far superb. So no existential threat. I think the main threats are inside us, inside Israel, among us, and not, uh, not, not from the outside. You know, I agree with you completely, and that's been the case, I think, for eight or ten years. But I'm always struck when I come to Israel 
that that's not what you hear when you sit down for those briefings because I think there is still a developed mindset in the Mossad, in Unit 8200, which does a lot of the cyber work, certainly among the military, that if they don't have that overhang of the existential threat that they heard about from their father and their grandfather and mother and grandmother, that somehow they've lost a bit of the national identity. They need a big enemy. They need an existential threat, as you say, in order to maintain their existence. But also, you know, the Prime Minister of Israel uh, is developing the sense of these, of these, uh, of these enemies. Um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, Israeli intelligence, and this maybe uh, should be a point, it, it see a, a real threat nowadays with the possible deployment of Iranian Hezbollah forces in Syria and in Lebanon. And circling back to the United States, they are in deep frustration for what the American has done on that sphere, or to be exact, for what the American has not done. Because the Iranians are deploying their forces and they are creating a diff an, another front for Israel. Israel even has a, a, a name for the next war. They will call it the first Northern War. So we had the first Lebanon War in 1982. We had the second Lebanon War with the confrontation with Hezbollah in 2006. And now the Israelis are expecting the first Northern War, which, be, which will be cross-border Israel against Iran and Hezbollah in both Syria and Lebanon. Now, Israelis appeal. They begged the Trump administration to, have, to exercise leverage on Russia and have the Russians, who are controlling Syria, in fact, preventing, preventing Iranian deployment in Syria. And the Trump administration did nothing. That created a lot of resentment and, and frustration from Israel. Not to say about leaks of information that Israel, sensitive information that Israel gave to uh, the Americans and are being leaked to, to several places. Um, and then Israel appealed to, to Russia because it didn't work with the, with the Americans. And so uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu traveled to the Kremlin a few times and asked Putin to intervene. And Putin has his own interests. He didn't know. And so at the end of the day, in January 2008, Israelis are left, that goes back to what you said about the mindset that you uh, meet again and again. Israelis are left with the mindset that they are alone again. And let me remind us just what happened 10 years ago when Israel discovered the secret Northern Korean, North Korea uh, nuclear reactor in Syria. And they, uh, Prime Minister Olmert asked President Bush to intervene and bomb it. And Bush refused. And Israel was left alone and bombed and destroyed the reactor. History does not repeat itself, but nowadays, exactly now, today we are close to that same situation. Israel is again feeling alone. And this is the worst mindset Close to the situation Israel. in the feeling alone, not close to the situation in the Syrians getting ready to have a nuclear capability that at this point, once it was bombed, it was pretty well, that program was pretty well over. Um, the Israelis, the Isra if, this, if this is not solved, the Israelis will destroy the Iranian deployment in Syria. This will happen sooner than later. So you raised the destruction of the Syrian reactor. Um, it was a story that my colleague Bill Broad and I broke, but boy, it took a long time for us three or four weeks to, understand. to get at it and to understand it because the Syrians were covering it up out of embarrassment, but the Israelis were covering it up for reasons I've never completely understood because I could imagine why it could have been to their advantage to say, yeah, you bet we blew it up the way we blew up Osirak, the, the Iraqi reactor. What was the difference? The Israelis are still covering up because the censorship still forbid everybody to speak about that. But let me quote Michael Hayden, the chief of the CIA at that time. He said, I had that discussion, candid, the most candid meeting I had with Dagan, which basically said that they were arguing. Um, he said, I thought, and my analysis, an analysts thought that if the US or Israel all together strike that reactor, Assad put with his back to the wall would not give up on his 
uh, pre damaged prestige, and he would strike back and start the war. And the mayor said, if we do it secretly, and he's not embarrassed, then he would do nothing, because his ally, the Russians and the Iranians, they didn't know that he's building a, a nuclear weapon. And he would try to conceal it. And the gun was right. So what Israel was betting was that if it destroys the reactor and maintain under th thick veil of secrecy, then Assad would not react because he, he wouldn't feel any way to you know, preserve his image as a, as, a, as, a, as a strong leader. And that worked. That was the reason, and that's still the reason why the Israelis do not talk about this. But I think that soon, um, something will be published in Israel because Israel is trying to send a message that as in 10 years ago, when Israel was left alone, it did not hesitate to act. It will not hesitate to act this time as well. Well, Ron, I'll ask you just one more question because um, we have an audience of people who want to buy your book. Remember, that's why we're here. Um, get your book signed. And then they want to race home to hear the State of the Union. Um, <laughs> So um, the question is this. When the history of Israel is written four or five decades from now, will the Mossad and the kind of techniques you describe in Rise and Kill First be as central to the next 50 years of Israeli history as they were to the last 50? more central because we could tell more. There are still secrets in the closet. The Mossad agenda is the most unique agenda or the most unique task list of any intelligence service in the world. There's no other intelligence service that needs to protect not just its people, but you know, Mossad is protecting Israelis, not just in Israel, but worldwide. And not just Israelis, it protects all Jews. Mossad kills targeted uh, or assassinate people worldwide and sabotage, etc., but also save Jews from rogue countries. It, it deals with refugees. There's no, there's no other intelligence service, intelligence community of that kind in the world. And that intelligence community, in its turn, secretly but profoundly had an, a serious, significant impact in, on, on, on the history of Israel and the region and the whole world. And, and in retrospect, I think we will see more and more we will understand, hopefully with the help of this, this book as well, we will understand how much of Israeli history was carved and changed and altered and shaped by the secret warriors of the, uh, of the, the people of the Jews. Well, Ronan Bergman, thank you very much. Thank all of you for your great thank questions. You so much.